Dr. Reed Noss. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thanks to the Natural Areas Association for inviting me two years in a row to participate in a plenary session. Last year I was in a panel discussion. Um, Sanjin is a hard act to follow, but I will do my best. Um, as, as Sanjin said, I've known him for many years uh, since he was a grad student with my, my colleague, Michael Sule. So let's see, the clicker. Um. <laughs> Sanjin, what does it look like? Maybe it's a... Ah, there fell. we go. Ah. Okay, here it is. So, okay, so I have changed my title slightly to better reflect the content. But uh, the point here at the beginning that I want to explore, um, as many of you are aware, the entire field of conservation has been in, an, in, a, in a kind of turmoil for the last decade or so. And this has happened before, but I think the last decade has, has really seen greater conflict in many ways than I've seen uh, since my career in this field. And basically what's happened is a um, loosely organized group of iconoclasts have challenged many of the fundamental tenets and values of conservation. Um, what's interesting and ironic is that these iconoclasts are not attacking this or, or even questioning the status quo. What they're doing in my of course, biased opinion, is trying to force conservation into the status quo of our thoroughly human-centered, growth-obsessed industrial culture. And predictably, the traditional conservationists, and I guess I now count as one of those, um, are fighting back. And I feel uneasy here. Usually I um, tend to, by nature, side with the iconoclasts. Here I'm torn. Um, I tend to feel that the traditional values of conservation are still very relevant, but I also agree with the iconoclasts that they're not always fully cognizant of what we understand of ecology and evolution, climate change, and so on that uh, we know today. We, we see in traditional conservation a lot of um, misunderstanding, misappreciation for change in nature, for disturbance, and often for an we often see a lack of understanding for the need for management, which I think many people here can relate to. Okay, um, the theme of this conference is conservation through collaboration. Collaboration, like any kind of consensus building process, requires at least some foundation in shared values. We don't have to agree on everything. Our values don't have to overlap completely, but we have to have at least some sense of, of purpose that, that we share. Um, I would have, for example, a hard time collaborating with someone who finds no intrinsic value in nature and who, and who thinks that human-caused extinctions are no big deal. It would just be very challenging for me. In fact, I probably couldn't do it. If we don't share some basic fundamental values, there's basically nothing to collaborate toward. So one of the, the themes of conservation and values that, are endure, that is enduring is this, this idea of wilderness. And wilderness has um, been a fundamental concept in American conservation since the 19th century. But after several decades of trying to get a national law passed, finally in 1964, um, the Wilderness Act was signed into law. And so last year, September of last year, uh, signaled the 50th anniversary of this law. And in this Wilderness Act, wilderness was defined, as you can see here, as um, an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. Now it's this latter phrase, and Sanjin alluded to this problem, that has gotten the wilderness concept on some, some shaky ground in recent years. I mean, what do we do, for example, with a wild area that has indigenous people living in it? Is it not a real wilderness, or do we make the indigenous people leave? Now, we haven't actually done that with any of our designated wilderness areas in the United States, but we have expelled native people and white settlers from some of our national parks, and this is problematic. We might not use this same language today. Untrammeled, on the other hand, I think is the real key word in this definition. 
This means not hindered, not restrained, not shackled by man. And I thoroughly agree that we need places like this. We need places that operate basically according to their own rules rather than our rules. And as John Muir and many other people pointed out, wilderness is good for people, especially when we're surrounded by technology all the time. This is not a healthy thing. We did not evolve in that kind of situation. So getting out into wild areas, and I'll get back to uh, the concept of wildness, which is a little different later on, but getting out in these areas where humans are not dominant, dominant is important to us as people and healthy. The wilderness idea has evolved over time, something I think that is not appreciated enough by many of the critics of wilderness. If you look at Aldo Leopold as an example, as many of you know, Aldo Leopold is considered the father of wildlife management, but also more than any other single person, he was the father of the modern wilderness movement. And in 1922, Leopold proposed the very first um, wilderness area, a big portion of the Gila National Forest in um, New Mexico as wilderness, and in 1924, it was designated as federal wilderness, four decades before the Wilderness Act was signed. And in the, um, this designation, at the time of designation, I should say, wilderness, uh, Leopold defined wilderness in, in purely human terms, basically recreational terms, a place where you can have a two-week pack, pack trip. Um, later on, though, later in his career, um, he started emphasizing the ecological values of wilderness, places that can maintain complete food webs. And it's this ecological value of wilderness then that as an ecologist, I find most compelling. And I defined ecological wilderness as a, a place that is mostly self-managing and which has complete food webs and natural disturbance regimes. And these are important for a variety of reasons, one of which is, is scientific. In fact, Leopold described wilderness as a base datum of normality, a place where we can see nature operate under the same conditions that these species that are found there today evolved under. And trying to mimic that then with management would be a way to maintain healthy systems. So ecological wilderness provides that baseline, if you will. We have um, a lot of precedents for protecting ecological wilderness, or at least trying to, um, in the United States. Everglades National Park uh, in 1947 was the first national park established with the express purpose of protecting an ecosystem. Now, we haven't done a perfect job of that in this case due to water withdrawals and so on, but, but at least we tried. And in, in 19... Um, 78, we established um, a wilderness area there, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Wilderness that covered some 86% of the park. So here, even in the east, not necessarily in the wild west, we still have areas where we can maintain, or at least try to maintain, ecological wilderness. These areas are important for many reasons. Um, wide ranging species require large wild areas with minimum human interference. Look at some of these figures for the area that these um, large carnivores and migratory ungulates require. In Yellowstone, wolf populations have, you know, average pack territory size of 344 square miles. The American pronghorn, which is probably my favorite ungulate worldwide, it runs as fast as a cheetah, by the way, Sanjin, I think you probably know that. Why does it run as fast as a cheetah? Does anybody know why this runs so fast? Probably. It evolved with the cheetah as its major predator, apparently. We had cheetahs here in North America as well. But in any case, these large, wide-ranging animals need a lot of space, and so big wilderness provides some of this space. And also, we're learning now from numerous scientific studies that in many cases, not all, many cases, apex predators control or regulate entire food webs, promoting diversity. This is particularly true and from a natural area standpoint for the so-called matrix communities, the dominant vegetation types in a landscape. Less true for the patch communities, which are often more bottom-up regulated by microclimate, geology, soils, hydrology, and so on. 
But wide-ranging animals like these apex predators and large carnivores and migratory ungulates require a lot of area and so they are vulnerable to habitat fragmentation across huge area, areas, millions of square miles sometimes. And so we rarely have the opportunity to maintain single patches of habitat that are millions of acres in size. And for these large carnivores, migratory ungulates, and other species, connectivity at a regional or even continental scale is necessary in the long term to maintain viable populations. But it doesn't have to be that big. We now know that beetles, butterflies, rodents, and salamanders, frogs, many smaller organisms also require connectivity. And the fundamental value of connectivity is that it can create, if we do it right, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. In that no single natural area might maintain a viable population of a given species of interest. But if we have a connected suite of habitats, we might maintain a viable population or metapopulation. Well, I've been interested in connectivity for a long time. Um, back when I was a graduate student, I designed a network um, of connected natural areas in Florida. This is an artist's um, representation of what at the time was a big wall-sized map, one to 500 scale. This was pre-GIS, you know, so you couldn't easily transfer a map like that into um, a smaller version. But you can see, um, you can imagine, I suppose, that this was perceived as a bit um, controversial at the time. We had a, a Florida Wildlife Corridor Conference, and this map ended up on the front pages of several newspapers around the world, and my advisor was worried that I was going to be kicked out of college, basically. I was only slightly less worried. But amazingly enough, within a few years, literally within four or five years, a refined version of my map was being promoted by state agencies, by the Nature Conservancy, by Florida Audubon as a way to help design or help channel public funds for land conservation in Florida. And Florida for three decades spent more money on land conservation than any state in the country and the entire U.S. federal government um, across the nation. And this is a, um, a recent version of what's now called the Florida Ecological Greenways Network that has been used to promote land conservation and to set priorities across the state. And it works. It works for small organisms, but also for some of our most space demanding, like the Florida panther, which keeps trying to get back into some of its former haunts in central and north Florida and northward. Uh, panthers have showed up as far north almost to Atlanta, for example. But this is the path of a one particular panther, panther number 62, and the vast majority, over 80 percent, of the radio telemetry locations of this panther were within this proposed Florida Ecological Network. Over recent years, a number of other states around the country have come up with similar connectivity networks, and at these broad scales, again, wide-ranging species such as bears, mountain lions, and others are used primarily to design these networks. Unless you think that these are radical kind of eco-freak schemes, just look at the sponsors of this work. California Department of Transportation, Department of Fish and Game, and the Federal Highways Administration sponsored this California Essential Habitat Connectivity Project. So connectivity has become mainstream. It's well accepted now. Less accepted, I think, still, even by the conservation community. Less accepted than apex predators and their importance, less accepted than big areas, than connectivity is natural disturbance regimes. And so I've been making a real point, as have many of you in this audience, to get people to appreciate fire, flood, windstorm, other things that keep nature healthy, that promote regeneration. It's just as important, I think, um, the data show, as top-down regulation or bottom-up regulation in maintaining biodiversity. I call these sideways controls on ecosystems because they're not quite the same as either top-down or bottom-up. And they often require large areas. I think um, a landmark paper in this field was one published before the modern term conservation biology was even coined. Um, Pickett and Thompson, Stuart Pickett, John Thompson published a paper in 78, which defined a minimum dynamic area 
um, based on natural disturbance regimes, an area which maintains internal recolonization sources so that disturbed areas can be recolonized on site rather than to have to rely on distant sources of propagules. And it's nice that we still have in this country places that we can let natural disturbance regimes operate. They're becoming fewer. But places like Yellowstone National Park, this is, um, this is a great photo, it's taken from the International Space Station back in September 2009. And here we had a, a relatively small fire, consumed about 10,000 acres. The weather changed, a rain, you know, cold front with rain came in, fire went out on itself. The Park Service just watched. They didn't have to do a thing. And we even have opportunities for that, again, in eastern parts of this country, such as, again, South Florida. This is a fire, um, summer before last, that was set by lightning uh, in the Everglades. Park Service watched it, didn't do a thing, it fulfilled its function. Many of our ecosystems in the south, as I think probably all of you here know, are fire dependent. Not just maintained, but if they don't get fire, they change to something radically different and we lose biodiversity. I was looking at a map um, by Davis, published in the 60s, of historic natural vegetation in Florida. And just by eyeballing it, I'd say that it looks like over 90% of our ecosystems in Florida are truly fire dependent. Something that the vast majority of the public and even many conservationists don't yet understand. Well, I'm going to change track here a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about time, deep history, deep time. We usually think of wilderness in, in spatial terms, but there's also a, a temporal component here because most of virtually all of the species that we have on Earth today evolved under conditions that we would describe as wilderness. Think about it. Virtually every area on Earth has been wilderness for over 99.9% .9 of its history. So this wilderness was the ecological context in which the vast majority of our species evolved. If we change that context radically, we shouldn't be surprised that we're going to lose a lot of species. So thinking about then deep time, I want to talk about one of my favorite, personal favorite ecosystems, the longleaf pine ecosystem which was the dominant upland vegetation across the coastal plain and even extended into the southern parts of the Blue Ridge, Ridge and Valley. There's been a controversy over whether this ecosystem goes way back in time or whether, it, in fact, it was created or at least shaped um, by indigenous people burning the landscape. We now have information that can answer this question pretty definitively. We know at the time that the first Europeans arrived in North America that longleaf pine was the dominant vegetation across most of the area you see here in this map. But how far back did it go? Well, not, oh, let's see. We know that it, we have analogs of this system in the fossil pollen record and fossil vertebrate record um, that go way back. For example, in the um, uh, Miocene, about 18 million years ago, reconstruction of, of the ecosystem based on both plant and animal fossils show that it was an open pine-dominated system with some oaks. We know that some of the taxa that occur in a system like this, like saw palmetto, Serenella repens, are found in fossil deposits in the, Eocene, in the coastal plain going back to the Eocene. 50 million years ago. So it appears that these savanna um, fire dependent systems go way back. Okay, sorry, um, I got out of track here because I must have inadvertently skipped over this. But people who, who have questioned the antiquity of the longleaf pine system have, have looked at older fossil pollen data that show a expansion of pine pollen over the last 13,000 years ago. And I don't know if I have and I don't think, yeah, you can kind of see here my red dot. So here's the pine pollen expanding over the last 13,000 years pretty steadily. And the suggestion was that this is when people started becoming abundant on the landscape, burning the landscape, creating these open longleaf pine savannas. But now we have a much older, more complete fossil record. In fact, we have a fossil pollen record extending back continuously 
now 62,000 years in central Florida. And what you see if you look at this more complete fossil pollen record is periods of pine and oak dominance basically alternating but never completely leaving the scene, neither pine nor oak. And you can see that grasses also in the right column, Poaceae, the grass family, were also present throughout. And curiously, they were, grasses were even more abundant during the oak phases than during the pine phases, suggesting that the oak phases were not closed woodlands or even scrub. They were either oak savanna or possibly what we call the Florida dry prairie, these so-called now subtropical hyper-seasonal grasslands that have Quercus minima, dwarf oak, as a dominant species and could have contributed this pollen. So in any case, we now know that these pine systems and some other savannas go way back. Um, another measure of antiquity, of course, is endemism, especially, of course, paleoendemics. And if you look at the lower coastal plain in particular, especially Florida, you see a concentration of endemic plants as well as endemic animals, not shown in this slide. Um, these data are for um, plants that occur in 25 or fewer counties. And so county records of these plants are then um, added. And so you can see then that the hotspots of endemism are in these basically grass-dominated savanna type systems of the lower coastal plain. And so this high endemism, especially of ancient taxa, supports the arguments that these ecosystems are ancient. They're not recent uh, systems that were created by human activity. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit once again. And this concept of wildness is fundamentally different from wilderness in that it can contain humans. You can find it close to home. It's not an area that is remote. It's not necessarily completely untrammeled, but yet we need it. Um, one of the most um, compelling quotes from Henry David Thoreau is, in wildness is the preservation of the world. And he was talking about the human world fundamentally there. That we need wildness like we need nature, which was Sanjin's message. And he found, well, um, <laughs> Thoreau was not a wilderness fanatic by any means. He made one major wilderness trip to northern Maine and it kind of freaked him out. He, he much preferred a more settled landscape with some wild areas left. And now that I get older, I can sympathize more and more with this. So Walden Pond was just 1.4 miles from the center of Concord, Massachusetts. And so Thoreau could go home regularly to buy groceries, have his mom do his laundry. I mean, it really happened. But yet look what he found there. Look at this quote on the right. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. To front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. And so wild areas close to home are tremendously important. And I've always had my own Waldens. My current Walden, just by some odd coincidence, is just 1.4 miles from my home. It's called Mills Creek. It's part of the Florida trail system and it's connected to a whole series of wild areas across the state of Florida and um, beyond now, up into Alabama and Georgia. And this is close to home. It's something I don't have to travel far. If I go, sorry, just a little further, connected to Mills Creek, Mills Creek is a tributary of the Econ Lockhatchee River, where there are vast landscapes, hundreds of thousands of acres that are not wilderness. Um, they have livestock grazing. Um, there's not a lot of people that go out there, but they're close to home and tremendously wild. You can wander all day and not see anybody. And we also have this phenomenon in Florida that these wild areas nearby we share with apex predators that are perfectly capable of killing and eating us. Uh, fortunately, they, they usually choose not to. Um, a lot of people who are not Floridians come to Florida and are really freaked out by a scene like this. This particular hole in this, this is um, on the Mayaka River. In a cold spell, you can get 200 alligators in this hole and people come to fish there and some of these alligators are, you know, 12, 15 feet long. Um, and yet, I don't think there's ever been an attack at this place. Um, we did have, unfortunately, a, a swimmer die right near my home just a couple weeks ago, uh, killed by a 12-foot alligator. So when you enter water bodies in Florida, you have to be prepared to face a large predator. 
But I think the most important reason why we need to retain these wild areas is because they provide habitat for species that are sensitive to human persecution. For example, this cottonmouth uh, would be perfectly capable of living in your backyard if you had a water body nearby, but most people would not be too comfortable with that. So we need wild areas in the landscape to provide habitat for those species. And the alternative to providing habitat and to limiting the opportunity for human persecution and over-exploitation is extinction. And so last year marked a much sadder anniversary than the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. It marked the 100th anniversary of the extinction of the passenger pigeon. This extinction was especially um, troubling, I think, to many conservationists because still in the early 19th century, by the accounts of the best ornithologists of the day, this was the most abundant bird in the world. But by the end of that century, by 1900, this bird was extinct in the wild. The last individual died in a, in a zoo, Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So if we can eliminate the most abundant bird in the world, what is safe? It really makes you pause. So let's get back to the turmoil that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. People with these iconoclasts who call themselves by a number of names, new conservationists, new environmentalists, etc., often disparage many of these fundamental values, biodiversity, hotspots, wilderness, wildness, other things I've been talking about here. Probably the most notorious of these self-proclaimed new conservationists is Peter Kariva, the former chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy. He's currently at UCLA, but current chair of the science cabinet an advisory body to the Nature Conservancy. In, a, in an interview in the Nature Conservancy magazine, Kariva said, I'm not a biodiversity guy. He has also written that biodiversity hotspots aren't, should not be priority because they're just places with long lists of species. He stated that extinction is not really not nearly as important um, or big a concern as ecosystem function. So as long as we have enough important species that fulfill key roles around, it doesn't matter if the vast majority of species go extinct. And he's proclaimed in writing, conservationists will have to jettison their idealized notions of nature, parks, and wilderness, and forge a more optimistic, human-friendly vision. Well, I'm all for a human-friendly vision. I think we must all be, and we must all accept what Sanjin had to say about this. But what exactly is this more optimistic, human-friendly vision? I want to say right at the outset, I actually agree with most of these particular um, issues or themes here. Um, ecosystem services gets a lot of attention these days. Um, these are considered important by the new conservationists, especially when they provide direct economic benefits to humans. And this is really the same argument that Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the, Nash of the U.S. Forest Service, was saying in the um, early 20th century. In fact, Pichot said there's only two things of importance in the world, humans and natural resources. So this is the same kind of resourcism point of view. Another thing emphasized in the new conservation is working landscapes. For example, ranches, tree farms, etc. Again, I don't disagree with this. Conservationists have paid insufficient attention to semi-natural so-called working landscapes. I know in Florida, our most important lands within that Florida Ecological Greenways Network that I showed you are private working ranches. That's where most of our remaining biodiversity that isn't already in conservation areas can be found in these working ranches. Another um, area of emphasis in the new conservation um, is novel ecosystems. And again, this is something that we have to be more tolerant of because it's beyond our control to stop climate change. It's often beyond our control to completely stop invasion of exotic species. But to place highest value on these ecosystems makes me feel a little bit uneasy. Um, when we have any opportunity to maintain ecosystems dominated by native species, I think we have an ethical function to do that. Embrace the Anthropocene. Well, geologists are still uncertain whether the Anthropocene is a legitimate geological epoch. The promoters of this term use it more as an ideology 
great, he, humans are finally in charge of the earth. Um, I don't look at it quite that way. Another theme, and again, one that is important to do, is to partner with big corporations. However, it's not at least compelling to me when it involves greenwashing, which by definition means putting basically a green happy face on actions that are destructive to the environment. I think there's a better and more optimistic path. And what I promote now more than anything is natural history. A return to natural history, not just as a hobby and a pastime, but as a way to inform conservation and a way to bring joy back to conservation. This is how it works for me, and I know for many of us that are in this field. Starting at an early age, there at the top, you spend time in nature. You spend time outdoors, not usually in wilderness, but in semi-natural or at least semi-wild places. You develop an aesthetic and visceral appreciation for nature, wonder and curiosity. You then want to seek more knowledge about nature. And for some of us, that means going professionally into this field. For others, at least developing increasing respect and affection for nature as you learn more about it. This then leads to a situation where you're troubled by seeing, witnessing destruction of nature. But you do something positive, hopefully, you take action. And whether this is you know, writing your congressman, joining a conservation group, or sitting in front of a bulldozer, whatever your style is, you try to defend nature. But to prevent burning out, you gotta keep spending more time in nature. So hopefully this is a cycle that's repeated and repeated. Natural history is something which we could benefit from as a society. It, it differs from academic science, traditional academic science in a lot of ways. Um, there's more acceptance of observation as a complement to experimentation. You can do legitimate science without rigorous experiments. It rejects extreme reductionism. It takes a more holistic approach. And much of it must be learned and practiced outdoors as opposed to a laboratory. Most essentially, though, I think natural history insists on intimate familiarity with some aspect of biodiversity. Now, you might do this as a specialist. You might have a huge expertise in a particular genus or, fam or family of plants or animals. Or you might be a generalist, know a little something about geology, botany, zoology of a particular region. We need both, and I'm particularly impressed with people who are both. They're specialists that yet retain this broad knowledge. And like wildness, this is something that can be appreciated very close to home. And in fact, with natural history, often in our own backyards, unless you're unfortunate enough to live in the most dismal of urban hell holes. <laughs> and hopefully none of us live in the most dismal of urban hell holes. But there's also direct value of natural history for conservation. Conservation messages that are based on doom and gloom just don't work. Psychologists have been telling us that for a long time. Negative messaging doesn't inspire people. And so books like The Sixth Extinction, well, they're accurate, but they don't inspire people. Unfortunately, I don't think the ecosystems are, ecosystem services argument inspires people either. In fact, polls suggest that. Um, ecosystem services surely exist, but they're boring as hell. You know, you don't get excited about ecosystem services. On the other hand, natural history is inherently interesting to people, if well explained. You can engage people, you can innate, you can awaken their innate interest in biodiversity and wildness. And more directly, by knowing nature intimately, knowing things like habitat affinities, life, hit, life histories, behaviors, key ecological processes, we learn what it might take to keep these species and communities going through rough times. And these are rough times. So this kind of, of knowledge, this knowledge of deep history and of natural history interactions is what inspired my recent book um, on forgotten grasslands of the South. Like so many things, um, we need to start with the young. Engaging people in natural history uh, must start with kids, but continue through adulthood. 
uh, one thing that is pretty well established now, and Ed Wilson, which, who Sanjian, Sanjian mentioned on a couple occasions, wrote a book called Biophilia. He didn't coin the term. He's often credited with that. But he explained that people have an innate attraction and affiliation with nature. It's just a question of keeping that alive in our increasingly technological culture, where kids on average spend seven minutes outdoors. I mean, can you imagine that? Probably none of us were that unfortunate. But today, the average American kid spends only seven minutes outdoors. So getting them outside, teaching them natural history, I think is absolutely crucial for conservation. But even if you have some kind of uh, neurosis and you don't have an innate interest in nature, um, you might at least be interested to know that regular exposure to wild nature um, helps people out in very direct ways. It, in, it, it increases intelligence. It improves physical as well as emotional health. Numerous studies have shown this. And this is true for adults and children alike. And finally, I think it's critical that we retain within ourselves, but also help to foster within others a sense of wonder about nature. Um, the sense of wonder was the title of Rachel Carson's work in progress at the time of her death. It was published posthumously about a year later. It's too bad she didn't finish, but what she left is still extremely interesting. And basically the message there is one I've been trying to give you for the last few minutes, is that wonder, fascination with nature, joy and awe are much better motivators for fear or despair. So let's get on with it. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here.